Okay, please now bow your heads as we pray. Yes, Heavenly Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we want to say, speak to us now this morning through your word. Talk into our lives. May your word transform us. May we hear from you. May we be challenged, but moved to act and to respond to you, Lord Jesus. May your word fall on soft soil, our hearts, and may that seed grow, take root, and produce good fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Okay, so we first started off going through the book of James, and then I've kind of came, I came away from it, because we were looking at things in the church, deception in the church, we spoke about the New Age movement, um, dangers of the Word of Faith movement, um, we looked at some other things as well, I can't remember now, but so we took a detour from the book of James and um, I was hoping to go back to it, but I'm going to take another detour. So as the spirit leads, I tried to go that way. And I think this topic here is very important for us. So I've identified four important aspects that a person should take seriously when it comes to finding a church to attend. Now, you could probably find more than four. I could have used a different four, but I thought this four was quite important. Keeping in mind that there is no perfect church. So if you're looking for a perfect church, you will not find it. Very quickly, you're going to find someone annoying you and you're going to want to leave and go somewhere else. So there is no perfect church. And the fact that we are here is testament that it's not a perfect church. I'm here. It's not a perfect church. But there are some things that are important when it comes to finding the church for you to settle in. Firstly, a church, I believe, should have a high view for the scriptures. A very high view for the scriptures. This sounds obvious, but not always the case in every church. You may have heard of progressive Christianity. Who's heard of progressive Christianity or progressive theology? It's a movement now where people are sort of trying to revise the Bible and kind of move away from the traditional views of the Bible within the Protestant church. Not all of it is bad. Some of it is geared towards social justice and so on. But there's other elements in there which are not biblical. So we need to be aware of that. Not every church has a high view for the scriptures. Not everything in the Bible will be to our liking. You will read things in the Bible that will trouble you sometimes. But it's not God's word that needs to change. It is us that needs to be transformed by God's word. Let me say that again. It's not us, it's not the Bible that needs to change. It's us that needs to be transformed by God's word. The church you go to must be one where the God's word is faithfully taught. Key word, faithfully. Where the gospel is preached. And this should be done in both truth and love. If you have a lot of truth, it becomes very legalistic. If you have a lot of love, it becomes very liberal. So you need truth with love. Secondly, I believe a church should believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. We must understand that God is a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, there are some churches that sort of only talk about Jesus only. They are called Jesus-only churches. I know of churches like that. There are some churches where they do not mention the Holy Spirit so we need to have a very healthy view of the triune God. The Bible reveals the concept of the Trinity. The idea of it is revealed in scriptures. You will know that the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the idea is certainly present. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are co-equal. They are co-eternal, yet they have different and distinct roles within the Godhead. 
Did you catch that? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are co-equal, co-eternal, yet have different and distinct and unique roles within the Godhead. I think a third aspect needed in a church is this, which is often overlooked. A church is to have a respect for their leadership. The pastor or pastors, the elders and the diaconate, whatever that leadership structure is, should be respected. Now, obviously, this goes both ways. It should be reciprocated. It's hard to respect people that don't respect you. But often, the leadership, and certainly the minister, can be pushed around or patronised and manipulated. And I've heard of so many cases like this in the Baptist churches when I meet pastors. They are being pushed around and bullied by the, 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 the members of the church. That shouldn't be happening. There should be a high regard for the leadership. If a person cannot sit under a church leadership for whatever reason, whether, it's, whether they are in the right or in the wrong, for whatever reason, they should not be there. It would be better to leave and go elsewhere than to grumble and complain and moan and pester and be a burden to the minister and to the leadership. It's better to just leave and go somewhere else where you can sit under. And fourthly, this is the one I want to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 12. If you have your church Bible, it's page 1139. Okay, so verses 1 to 8 reads, this is Paul talking to the Romans. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Verse 3, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of us, to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Verse six, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. May the church say amen. God's word, I love it, it's powerful. If you look at verses one and two, it's about relationship to God. It's what we call that vertical relationship. It's all about our relationship with God speaks about our bodies being a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We're told not to conform to the pattern of this world. So that's our relationship with God, our vertical relationship. If you look at verses three to eight now, it's about horizontal relationship. The relationship we are to have with one another. 
more specifically with the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ. So this is my fourth point this morning. The church you attend is to be the place and environment for you to use your spiritual gift or gifts. The church you attend is the place and the environment where you are to use your spiritual gift or gifts. Verse 4 mentions that we have each one body. How many of you know that you have one body? When you look at yourself, you can see one body. But this one body has many members, has many parts. Some of them we don't like when we look in the mirror. But we have many parts. These members or parts do not all have the same function. Did you know that? They don't all do the same thing. Our body parts do different things and they have unique roles, yet they are of equal worth. I don't count my eye more valuable than my arm. I don't count my arm more valuable than my leg. They are of equal worth, but they have different functions. This concept actually is not new, is it? It goes back to Genesis, when the man and the woman were created, they were created equal in worth, equal in value, and in spirituality, and even one they become in marriage, yet they have unique functions. And some people don't agree with that, but I believe it's biblical. They have unique functions. In fact, it goes even further back than Genesis. It goes back to the Trinity. We have three persons of the Godhead who are what? Co-equal, co-eternal, and yet have unique roles. Now, your eyes do not see. Does any one of your eyes your eyes do see, actually. I made a mistake there. Did you catch that? Your eyes do not hear. Whose eyes hear? No. Your nose does not see. Your hands do not walk, although I know some people can actually walk on their hands. But you get the point. Each part of our body has a function and a role to play. Now let's look at verse 6. It says we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. There's two things in that actually. Different gifts, but also according to the grace given to each of us. So the different amounts of grace given to each of us as well. Our gifts come from where? Where do they come from? Lisa Ray, where does our gifts come from? Our spiritual gifts. God, thank you. <laughs> okay. God, yes it does. He gives us these gifts according to his grace and his love. So we do not get a gift because we are more special than someone else. We do not get a gift because we are more wonderful than someone else. We are given spiritual gifts because God is loving. God is so gracious. Now, the gifts mentioned here in Romans chapter 12 are prophecy, service, teaching, encouragement, giving, leadership, mercy. Here we can see that there are gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians and 1 Peter, also Ephesians 4 as well. And you can see by looking at this that there are some gifts that overlap, the ones that are in italics. I'm going to go through these ones in Romans chapter 12 and see if you can identify the gift that you have. Prophecy. That is utterances inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is calling people to repentance and revealing God's future plans. Prophecy is a very important gift, by the way, as you'll see in a few moments. 
It comes from the Holy Spirit. You cannot do it unless it is from the Holy Spirit. Service. Service is giving practical help in both physical and spiritual matters. Seeing things that need to be done and doing them. The Greek word there is diakonia, where we get the word diaconate. We have deacons. The next one is teaching. Being able to explain the word of God and apply it to the hearts of the hearers. This is slightly different to preaching, which is the proclamation of the gospel. Teaching is instructing people in God's teachings. Also with exaltation, meaning to urge and encourage people to practice what they are taught. I think that's very important to capture as well. Teaching is not just explaining God's word, but it's actually urging people to practice what they have heard. The next one is encouragement. Encouraging and comforting others so that they live a life devoted to God and grow spiritually. Do you do that? Encouraging and comforting others so that they live a life devoted to God so that they can live spiritually and grow spiritually. Next one is giving. Being aware of needs and giving to it. Often financial help, and it can include food and possessions. Something important there as well. It's not just giving, but it's being aware of the needs. To give, you need to be aware of the need. Very important. Leadership. Leading and overseeing the needs of the local church. Elders and deacons, for example. And a person's household, actually, is very important when it comes to leadership. God always looks at the household and how the household is run and conducted for leadership. Mercy. This is identifying with and comforting those in distress. Demonstrating kindness to those in need and doing all that with cheerfulness. So there's two things there. You're comforting those in distress, but you're also identifying those people in distress. Notice it's the same with giving, being aware of the need before you give. So keep in mind that as followers of Christ, we should be doing a lot of these things anyway. But what I'm talking about here is particular giftings that come from the Holy Spirit in these areas. So we can be doing some of these things already in our lives. But here we're talking about a particular gifting of the Spirit. I want to make a point here. Sometimes when we think of ministry, we think of being at the front of the church. Sometimes when you hear the word ministry, sometimes people think about being on the stage or behind the pulpit. But actually, in this context, it's a broad term meaning service for the Lord. So shouldn't we all be in service for the Lord? We are all involved as followers of Christ in ministry. Each follower of Christ is to be involved in ministry. That is service for the Lord. Every single one of us. Here's another important one here. Every single person that calls themselves a Christian is not to forsake the gathering of ourselves, Hebrews chapter 10, 25. That means we are to gather regularly. That means go to church. And then when we are there, we are to serve the Lord in that fellowship with our spiritual gifts. So I've touched on something very important there and I hope you caught it. I know we've had lockdown and there's been issues about gathering but in the grand scheme of things I'm talking about, we are to gather. We are not to forsake the gathering of ourselves. The Christian 
is to use their gift for service in the church, but that cannot happen if they are not present. It goes without saying, doesn't it? When I thought about this the other day, it really made me sit up and think. If I'm supposed to use my gift for the service of the Lord, but I'm not present, how can I then use it to benefit the body of Christ? It made me think, hold on, attendance is very important. So what I want to say here actually is that the first part of our ministry and service to the Lord Christ, to the body of Christ, is attendance. That is actually a service to the Lord, to attend and gather together as a body of Christ. Did, anyone, any, did any of you think that, like that? That by attending, that is service to the Lord. How can a person be strengthened? How can a person be encouraged? How can they grow spiritually if they are not around the body of Christ? If they are in isolation, they go through stuff during the week, difficulties and problems and hearing people say stuff. If you do not gather with the body of Christ, how then are you strengthened? I remember before I came here to Brighton Road Baptist Church and I was working in the council. There was a very difficult time I went through where it seemed like the atheism in the church just ramped, in, sorry, in the council, ramped right up. I had atheist work colleagues that I worked with, but it seemed as if their, their views and everything just ramped right up. And every single day I was being bombarded with the stuff that they were saying, deliberately in the work, in the office, even down to the manager, mocking and talking about how he wishes to go to hell anyway because he would have a lot more fun in hell. My actual manager sitting next to me saying this. And all the work colleagues around me were just talking stuff. And I remember this was so difficult. It was okay having that sort of one-to-one -one conversation with people, but when it just became the whole office mocking, I thought, what is this? And so my church attendance became very important. I needed to go to church and I needed to hear the message from the pastor. I needed to be around other Christians because every single time I was going to work from Monday to Friday, I was being hit hard, almost being silenced. We need to be in the body of church. We need to grow spiritually. We need to support the body of Christ. The church is a family. Did you know that? This is a family. Can you imagine every time your family comes around the table for dinner and there's always a person missing? All the time. The church is a unique spiritual body. It is unique because there's nothing like it on earth. The church, there's nothing like it. It is spiritual because it is the work of the Holy Spirit that puts it together. And it is a body because God uses believers in different roles to build the church. We are to build the church together by strengthening each other. Because it is God who gives us these spiritual gifts, we are not to behave arrogant with them. Because it's God who gives it to us by grace. Paul gives us a warning in verse 3. Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. And this is because actually when it comes to spiritual gifts, there tends to be pride that comes with it. Pride tends to arise when it comes to spiritual gifting. This is why Paul said, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. And this is exactly what was happening in the church in Corinth. And the Apostle Paul had to try and sort it out. To what was happening in the church of Corinth? People were using their gifts in a competitive way. Speaking in tongues became the number one gift to have. Everybody wanted that one. And they were showing off with it. They were talking over each other, babbling over each other, and the, the, the corporate worship, the gathering, became a mess. And it became confusing. I also remember somebody at work 
in the council saying to me, or saying to all of us in fact, that they visited a church in Croydon and all they did was speak in tongues and she thought, said, what nonsense was that? They were just acting like animals and everybody was laughing in the office. Paul said this, let there be two or three to take it in turns to speak in tongues. I'm talking about in the corporate worship, in a gathering. And when they do, we need interpretation so that people can understand what the person is saying and what God is saying through them. There needs to be interpretation when we're speaking in tongues in the corporate gathering. Otherwise, it's just confusing. The unbeliever comes in and they just don't know what is going on. Paul even said this. He said he would rather everyone prophesied. Remember I said at the beginning, prophecy is, the, is very important. He said this one he would rather people did rather than speaking in tongues. Why? Because it edifies the body of Christ. It edifies, it encourages people. Prophecy encourages people. So when they're speaking in tongues with no interpretation, it causes problems in the church. And this is why some churches don't do it on a Sunday morning. They leave it to sort of Bible study or prayer meeting. When we do speak in tongues, it's very good for us, and it's that language that only God can understand. Utterances that only God, the Spirit, can understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So we are not to claim the gifts either. We're not to claim them. God may give us the gift, but we don't say, yes, yeah, they are ours. They are gifts. The gifts are not toys to play with, and they are not weapons to fight with. Have you ever thought about this? It is wrong to abuse your gift, but it's also wrong not to use your gift. The same way it's wrong to abuse your gift and use it as a weapon and compete with it, it's also wrong to actually sit back and not use your gift. Why? Because God gives us these gifts. And so it's an act of pride now when we don't use them. It's an act of pride. For God to give you the gift and you don't use it. We are to use our gifts and we do it actually in faith. And God will give you the necessary strength to use your gift. So whenever you're using your gift, God will give you the necessary strength to use it. He will help you whilst you use your gift. You're not alone. So the question follows, what is your spiritual gift? or gifts this morning. Have you identified your gift? Some people would say it's not necessary to label your gift or try to find the label. Sometimes we can get caught up in trying to label the gift. You may be doing it already and you're trying to find the label to say, what is this one? But the key is that we are using the gift that God has given us. Are you particularly good at planning and organizing? Are you particularly good at planning and organizing? Then perhaps you have the gift of administration. Are you good at communicating the gospel to non-believers? Then perhaps you have the gift of evangelism. Do you have a natural ability to make people, including strangers, feel comfortable and welcome in the church and in your home? Then you perhaps have the gift of hospitality. Do you have the ability to separate truth from error and to spot deception and falsehood? Then perhaps you have the gift of discernment. Are you able to apply knowledge to various situations and make good decisions and good choices? Then perhaps you have the gift of wisdom. Do you have a talent for identifying tasks? that need to be done and using available resources to get the task done, then perhaps you have that gift of serving. Now again, I said you can still do all these things. You can have the gift of teaching and still serve. You can have the gift of uh, leadership and still have mercy. But, but sometimes God will just give you that particular gifting in that area. 
What is your gift and are you using it this morning? We cannot have any gift we want, by the way. The Holy Spirit distributes them as he sees fit. Gifts can take time to mature and develop into their full effectiveness. So this morning, you may have a gift, but it will still mature the more you use it. It will grow the more you exercise that gift. So we are to be faithful with our gift. And we are to use it. And did you know that gifts can be lost? You can lose your gift when it's not used and when it's not developed. You may remember the parable of the bags of gold in Matthew chapter 25. So use your gift and develop it. Make much of it. The final big question, which, is, which will be for next week, is how can we best serve our church? How can we best serve our church? And I think this is the question that every single one of us as believers and as followers of Christ should have when we come through those doors every Sunday morning. How best can I serve this body of Christ? How can I strengthen it? How can I help to build it up? How can I encourage somebody in their faith? Every single believer has a part to play in building up, encouraging, and supporting and edifying the body of Christ. Every single one of us, down to the youngest, has a part to play. I personally believe that every single time one of us any one of us steps into the church building, particularly on a Sunday morning, the thoughts and prayer should be in our head. How can I serve this morning? As soon as you enter, you should be thinking, not even as soon as you enter, before you even enter, you should be thinking, how can I serve this morning? What tasks need to be done? What can I learn to do? Lord, use me to be a blessing to someone. Empower me and guide me in my speech and in what I do today. What should be in your head when you enter in the morning is, who needs encouragement? Who can I pray for? Who needs a hand? Who is struggling? Who can I assist? Lord, give me an opportunity to bring glory to your name. They are the thoughts I believe you should have as soon as you wake up on a Sunday morning and know that you're coming to church. That is what drove me and motivated me to go to Spurgeon's College, then to do the theology, then to be here. It was this whole burden of what can I do to serve the body of Christ. And as you know, when we came here in 2013, it was a placement when we came here as a family. And I was doing two Sundays at my previous church and two Sundays here, and I was happy to do that. Because I liked my previous church and I wasn't ready to leave. But something bothered me, something bothered us. The church we were going to they had more help than they needed. Every single role was taken care of. And so I would go there, I would sit and just enjoy the sermons and be strengthened and be built up. And I loved it. But then when I came here, I saw the need. And this is what's happened to many people that have gone to Spurgeons and have gone into placement into Baptist churches. They saw the need and they were burdened. And it burdens you. I saw a few doing much and it bothered me. And I said, Lord, I've been a Christian for quite a long time now. I know the stuff. But Lord, you need to use me so that I can help somewhere. So I can help somehow and help build and strengthen the church. And so we made a decision that we would need to be here for the four Sundays of the month rather than visiting the other church. 
And so I end here. The body, every member of the body, every part of the body needs to be functioning and working. And so I would have you question yourselves as you come here in the mornings and ask, where can I fit in? Where, what can I do? Who needs assistance? Look at those who are doing that same thing week in, week out and ask, can I take the load off them? Can I help them? So that it's not on them all the time because that can wear people out. And so I urge Brighton Road Baptist Church, there may be few of us, but to pull together, to offer assistance, to pray for people, to encourage people. Use your gifting. Assert yourself. Come forwards. And let's build the body of Christ together. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Son, Holy Spirit, again, I know that sometimes your word is challenging to us, but I believe that's how it's supposed to be because we are to be transformed to you and to your word. And often that's an uncomfortable process. Lord, move us to serve, to be a part of the ministry, service for the Lord. Strengthen us in our giftings. May we know that you are with us with those gifts and that you will help us when we are using them. May we see the need and react. May we all feel responsible together as a family, the body of Christ, to work together. And may the church be encouraged and strengthened in faith to live out your word to grow spiritually, to grow and mature and to be an impact, to have an impact to our community and those around us. Grow your church, Lord, and mature us, we pray, and be the head of the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.